morning, everybody. Um, my talk is a little bit more uh, about me telling you all a story, luckily a story that has a lot of, um, grounded in a lot of factual information. So it's less about technical details, and I think um, you just had a precursor talk to mine. There's an excellent summary about techniques that we commonly use in biological research, uh, especially pertinent to cancer, which is my area of interest. Um, but what I'll be telling you more about is um, what's sort of the current understanding of cancer? How do we approach it in general, even though there's always several um, medical experts that uh, help a patient once they're diagnosed with cancer? My role is usually that of a surgeon, uh, but no less important, in fact, probably more important, is that of a role of a medical oncologist that helps tailor uh, therapy, particularly chemotherapy, and nowadays uh, targeted therapy, like biological therapy, uh, and also radiation oncology. Um, they are doctors who help when it's appropriate uh, to treat the patient or the area that they've been operated on with radiation. Um, and there's a lot of social support that's usually uh, afforded to them as well. But I'm gonna be focusing on uh, the biological aspects of cancer as you understand it. And just as a case in point, I'm gonna be illustrating these concepts using breast cancer as a model, but it can easily be extended and extrapolated to other solid cancers that we deal with. So the title of my talk is um, Breast Cancer Biomarkers um, from Serendipity to Rational Discovery. And what I wanted to highlight is um, as we've gone along uh, discovering various facets of the biology of cancer, our initial discoveries were not always necessarily by design, but often by accident. Um, but as we've gone along further from that, we see that it all really fits in and makes sense. Uh, and nowadays, the way we go about trying to discover biomarkers, and I'll get into telling you what they are, um, is now done in a much more designed fashion, now that we understand things a little bit better. Um, so just by way of disclosures, I'm a named inventor on some patents related to a gene of interest uh, to me uh, in cancer. And um, I have stock ownership in a company called Oracle Biosciences, um, which sounds very impressive, but it's actually half of a lab bench in my lab over at Carl. And the only reason it exists is to take advantage of a grant mechanism from the NIH. <laughs> so that being said, what are cancer biomarkers? Well, I th I'm sure you've all heard of it. I'm sure you've read about it, both in uh, textbooks as well as, you know, um, on the internet and other places, uh, biomarkers are things that we can measure that helps tell us uh, whether someone is prone to developing cancer, already has cancer, has a certain type of cancer, and how progressed is their cancer. And whether, if they're getting treatment, is that treatment really working for them or not. So that's a lot of things that the bio word biomarker can tell you. So obviously there's not one type of biomarker. And we come up with um, several descriptions of them, or there are different types. So if we're measuring a protein, or a carbohydrate, or a lipid, or combinations of these types of molecules in the blood or the serum of the patient, they're called serum biomarkers. And the biggest use of these are um, for screening, meaning the patient's completely fine, but they have a strong family history of get, getting one or the other type, how likely are they to get it, get a certain type of cancer in the next three years, next five years, next 10 years? Are they at risk at all? Um, so if you can measure something in the blood and tell, that's usually a serum biomarker or a serum screening biomarker. If you're measuring it at the actual tissue level of a biopsy that was taken, um, and usually this is a sample of cancer tissue that was removed, because it came to attention through other means, like they were scanned or a picture was taken of their body and um, a suspicious spot came to light, either in the breast or other parts. And then they had an image-guided biopsy performed, which is to take out a small sample of the tissue. If you're measuring these molecules on the tissue, then they're called tissue biomarkers. And the biggest use of these is actually to diagnose whether they have cancer or not and to diagnose if they have a certain subtype of cancer or not. Um, so we spoke a little bit about screening biomarkers. Those are mostly in the serum, but they can also be in the urine or other bodily fluids. Um, a little bit more about the tissue biomarkers. 
as I said, most of them are used to diagnose a certain kind. So they would fall under the category of diagnostic biomarkers. Well, there's something else that's called prognostic biomarkers. And what these are, are molecules or biomarkers that tell us how is this person, once they've been diagnosed with this particular type of cancer, how are they likely to behave over time with respect to survival? Because that, after someone has a diagnosis of cancer, you really want to try to get a sense, is this likely a curable type or not? Even with appropriate therapy, are they likely to survive or not? If they do, how long are they going to survive? How long are they going to survive disease-free? How long are they going to survive without metastasis occurring to other parts of the body? So all of these different things that I was mentioning help measure prognosis. And you can often tell prognosis for the patient based on whether they have this particular gene or protein or carbohydrate or lipid profile there. And also you could tell based on how much of that is being expressed or is present in the tissue. Um, the third kind is predictive biomarker. These are biomarkers that help tell you um, how likely is someone to benefit from a certain specific kind of drug or therapy or biologic target uh, therapy. Um, so they help predict whether you're going to have efficacy with a certain type of drug or treatment or you're not and are you going to waste your time giving that patient that kind of therapy. So that's the utility of knowing whether a patient has these markers or not on the tissue because ideally you want to tailor treatment that is likely to work best for that particular person. You don't want to waste time giving them things that are not going to work because that's valuable time. Um, if something does all three, meaning it can help diagnose, it can help prognosticate, and it can help predict therapy, well, there's a new term uh, that's called theranostic biomarker, and you're likely going to see this being used more because uh, this is the ultimate biomarker that we all strive to find. Can you find one molecule that is serving all three purposes for that specific uh, cancer or subtype of cancer? And in fact, we'll see two examples of these that we stumbled upon by accident, but in hindsight, they turned out to be theranostic biomarkers. Um, so just to give you a historical timeline of what happened in breast cancer, the f you know, first molecule that seemed to predict uh, importance in breast cancer biology was the estrogen receptor, or ER. That happened in 1962. Before we figured out that you could target it with drug therapy, there were several years elapsed, so it was in 1990 that we f uh, figured out you could target this gene or this receptor um, with a drug called tamoxifen. Now there's a whole slew of related compounds. Uh, and uh, this is basically serving to illustrate how much time it takes from when you first discover a biologic concept uh, before you're actually able to exploit it for treatment. Um, the next gene of interest was something called HER2. HER2 stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2. So it belongs to a fairly large family of proteins. Um, they're um, epidermal growth factor receptors. This happened to be the second member that was discovered but it happened to be very important in a subgroup of breast cancer. And they figured out that it was contributing to aggressive growth of about 25% of breast cancers. But they didn't figure out how to target it until 1998. And that's when a drug called Herceptin came along, and many of you heard about that one. So just to tell you who the people were behind all these discoveries, uh, these are by no means the only individuals involved these discoveries involved hundreds of investigators, but um, this is just to highlight the first <coughs> papers that were reported. Uh, the top one is Dr. Jensen. He um, first came up with and proved that uh, certain breast cancers, in fact, up to 70% of breast cancers, depend on a hormone called estrogen. And without the receptor that helps bind the estrogen, these cancers essentially can't survive. Um, even though the word receptor is present in it, um, estrogen receptors are not present on the surface of a the cell. They're actually receptors that are in the nucleus, uh, and we'll see that a little bit later on. Um, several years, again, elapsed before a drug that was being developed for other reasons. Um, Dr. Uh, Jordan 
uh, Craig Jordan stumbled upon the fact that you could use this to target estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Before they came up with the word tamoxifen, it was uh, often called compound ICI-46474, but they figured that's a mouthful, so they came up with a better word. Um, these are uh, also reports that highlight that not only was the estrogen receptor important to diagnose that type of breast cancer, but also was important in predicting how would these people do over time. In fact, if you were estrogen receptor positive, you had a favorable prognosis. You did better uh, despite equivalent treatments than if you didn't have the estrogen receptor. So if you were ER negative, you did worse. Back then, we really didn't know why, because we didn't have an understanding about um, what, what types of molecules drove the growth for cancers that didn't depend on estrogen receptor. These curves are called Kaplan-Meier curves, for those of you that are not familiar with survival type curves. And this is the first sort of data that we all look at as clinicians to decide, is a gene or a molecule or a measured biomarker worth pursuing and investigating further to try to understand, or is it not making a difference really and not worth the thousands and millions of dollars that it needs to investigate uh, whether a gene is important or not. So these curves show you in a stepwise fashion, the top curve is the ER. The higher you up, the better you do over time. The lower you are, the worse your survival is. And each step side notch is unfortunately representing one patient that died at that period in time. Um, there are several types of curves like this. These curves, as you see, indicate recurrence, so that the patient didn't die, but the step was when they were diagnosed with the disease having a recurrence. A similar curve, if it says survival on the bottom, would mean it's overall survival or disease-specific survival. Um, only 145 patients were included in that study, but as you can see, that was enough to show a difference. These days, because treatment has improved, it takes a much larger study usually to demonstrate a difference. And sometimes you need up to two or 3,000 patients before you can say, well, one arm did worse than the other uh, before you can decide. But back then, we didn't have the benefits of modern chemotherapy, and so difference was pretty apparent, even with a group as small as 145. Um, this was by no means the only paper. There were many, many groups. The 335 patient study was another uh, study that was actually corroborating the results of the first one that was in Europe. And so with regard to estrogen, what did we find out? Well, it was definitely diagnostic for a specific group that if allowed to advance, it tended to metastasize to the bone. Um, that sounds pretty devastating to have <laughs> disease spread to the bone, but luckily in this age, even for women that go on to have metastasis to the bone, they survive and they survive very well because we have treatments for breast cancers that go to the bone, mainly because they're not aggressively growing like other types are. They don't metastasize to other organs like the brain, the lung, the liver, and other places. It's still not as favorable as not metastasizing, but what I was trying to highlight is biologically, an estrogen receptor positive tumor is much more favorable clinically because they don't behave as aggressively as others. We, we learned that it also is important from a prognostic standpoint. It could predict better disease-free survival if you have the receptor, uh, both overall survival as well as recurrence-free survival. You also knew now that it predicts for tremendous efficacy of treatment when you're using drugs like tamoxifen, which target the estrogen receptor, or now another class of drugs that are called aromatase inhibitors, where you don't depend necessarily on the receptor blockade, but even the mechanism within the cell, you can block the action of estrogen hormone. Um, so ER positivity predicts efficacy of this, these groups of drugs. So it's a predictive biomarker well. In fact, in hindsight, is the Theranostic biomarker, but we came about its discovery in a very roundabout way. Is this, this was not the only example. In fact, there was another protein that we spoke about earlier. It's called HER2. Uh, its implication in breast cancer biology was discovered by Dennis Slayman. Um, he used to be in um, San Antonio, which was a big center for breast cancer research, later moved to UCLA. Um, 
many of you probably never saw his picture, but saw uh, the actor that portrayed him in a, in a popular TV movie dem uh, that was basically produced to highlight the story and the success of this uh, approach to breast cancer therapy. This was the first target in solid cancers that was targeted successfully with a monoclonal antibody. Perceptin, and that's why this is often mentioned in many articles that you read about on biomarkers. But in short, um, uh, he discovered that the gene is an oncogene and that about 25% of breast cancers are very aggressive because of this gene. It drives their growth, it drives their ability to spread to other organs very rapidly, uh, and if not checked, uh, these patients often succumb to the disease very quickly. Um, he was the same person who kept working on this gene and trying to target it and proved in a clinical trial, the first trial actually, that if you target this gene on the breast cancers that have it with a monoclonal antibody, you made a real measurable difference in survival. Um, subsequently, you've had national trials and international trials go on to prove the same, but these were survival curves early on um, again, you don't notice differences as marked on, on the left, uh, which was the lower one is overall survival, but the upper one is disease-free survival. And, and the two sides, the, the difference is more marked on the right side. It has to do with how did they define presence or absence of amplification. Um, the, if the amplification was just assessed as present or not, it wasn't good enough to distinguish the groups. But if you used a definition that says you needed greater than five copies of the gene to define the amplification versus anything less than five was considered negative, that's when you saw the difference uh, present. Meaning you need at least five copies of the gene to be amplified for it to exert biological activity. Um, so this is the second example, again in breast cancer, that the presence of this molecule on the breast cancer, by the way, this receptor is present on the cell membrane of the cell, and that's where it binds with the growth factor receptor. Um, it was diagnostic for this group. Again, it's a group of breast cancers that when advanced has a different metastasis profile. It goes to the lung as a first preference site and later to the brain. Uh, it's prognostic because it was telling you how would these patients survive over time. You did worse if you were HER2 positive than you were HER2 negative. And third, it was predictive of efficacy, initially of Herceptin, but now there's other classes of drugs like Lepatinib and others that have come along that target either the HER2 receptor or the HER2 pathway. And, and so again, in hindsight, this is another example of a theranostic biomarker. So our understanding of breast cancer classification uh, originally was you either didn't have breast cancer or you had it. But since then, we've come to understand breast cancer is not a single disease. It's in fact a mixture of three very closely related entities. And often, the orange, blue, and red looks exactly the same under the microscope unless you stain the cells for different markers. And by the word stain, I'm referring to antibody specific for binding to estrogen receptor or HER2 receptor or not binding to them, which is the loosely described triple negative group. As you can see, the ER and the HER2 are pretty distinct ovals, but the triple negative is still kind of fuzzy because its definition up until the point in this, this, this up to this point, it's not very good. You're, you're defining it based on the absence of two things. That has inherent error in it. Meaning, if you're gonna depend on the, your measurement of two things like ER and HER2, and you're basing your definition on the inability to detect them, what happened if your test has an error in it? What if it's a false negative and it's actually there? You didn't really define triple negative very well. And uh, it doesn't, sound like a big deal until you realize that in the clinic, people that you're labeling as having triple negative breast cancer may not have it. You're actually giving them very aggressive treatment because they're, they do the worst actually among the other, other two. Uh, and some of them you're giving unnecessary uh, toxic treatments to uh, 
that weren't needed in the first place because they are not technically triple negative. They either are slightly positive for ER or slightly positive for HER2. Yes? Uh, so, um, what is the third thing that is absent? Uh, that's what I was getting to, but up until this point, oh, the third thing for triple is a hormone receptor called PR. It's progesterone receptor. Its role in the biology of breast cancer is not as well defined and I was purposefully excluding it from today's talk, but it usually, its expression goes along with estrogen receptor. Um, its significance is actually in tumors that are ER negative, but are PR positive and HER2 negative. That's sort of the sub subset of the three where the PR tends to play the biggest role. Um, and uh, there's actually two different types of progesterone receptor. Uh, One's in the cytoplasm, one's in the membrane. Um, and unfortunately, its description of its importance in biology is not as well defined. So that's why, for simplicity, I was going to leave it out today. But, but that's what is included in the triple, ER, PR, and HER2. So if it's negative for all three, we, we'd loosely call those groups of patients triple negative, or their cancers, rather. Um, so this was our understanding up until now. Obviously, we wanted to improve it. So, but this, this classification was starting to make sense with how we thought about breast cancers clinically. If you were ER positive as a diagnostic biomarker, your clinical outcome was of, of an indolent disease, meaning slowly progressive. Um, you could have personalized therapy with tamoxifen, arimidex, and other drugs. If you were HER2 positive, you were more aggressive than the ER, but you're less aggressive than the triple negative. And again, your disease could be targeted with drugs that are called Herceptin and Lepatinib. Now, by the way, when I say could be targeted by drugs, I don't mean as first line, meaning if someone gets diagnosed with breast cancer, it is still not recommended just to give them the drug and to see how they do. The treatment is still first to debulk the disease as much as you can with surgery, and then give them the drugs only if they have evidence of being at risk of the disease already spreading. What do I mean by that? Well, it, for example, breast cancer usually occur occurs in the breast tissue, but most breast cancers spread through the lymph nodes, and so a routine part of the surgery is to check the lymph nodes in the patient to make sure disease hasn't at least gotten that far. If it has, then we don't know if it's gotten further in the body, meaning to other, other lymph nodes or other organs or even if they're not visible or detectable on scans or ultrasounds or CT scans or MRIs, it may be because it's not there, which is great news, but it may also be because they're microscopic in extent of disease, they're below the limits of detection of those scans, and in fact, they're hiding. They're hiding to erupt into large masses of cells that may become apparent down the road. We usually don't wait for that to happen in people that are lymph node positive and that's the scenario where we give them targeted drugs like tamoxifen, Herceptin, and others. Um, I can answer questions about that kind of stuff later, but um, at, at that point in the discovery process, a very important thing happened, and I think all of you uh, may know, in about 2001, uh, the entire human genome was sequenced. That was very exciting because we had finally the raw data information to tell everything about the genome, both in a normal person, but also it opened up avenues for you know, investigating cancer on a completely different footing. We didn't have to do any more with tools that were inadequate. We didn't have limitations. Well, you can look at some proteins, but you can't look at others. You can tell about some aspects of the DNA, but not others. We finally had the entire DNA sequence, all the chromosomes, uncoded. Obviously, the work wasn't done, but it was very promising as an event. In fact, a year before this seminal discovery, um, another paper had come out in Nature, and this was by Dr. Peru. At that time, he was in Stanford. Currently, he's at UNC. For the first time, they took patient samples from approximately 100, 120 breast cancer patients. They measured the RNA level in the tumors of all of these patients. Not only did they do that, they measured the RNA essentially of every possible gene that could possibly get converted from DNA to RNA. 
and this type of high throughput profiling was called transcriptomics. And this was at the RNA level. If you do it at the DNA level, and we'll get into that in a minute, it's called genomics or genomic profiling. If you do it at the protein level and it's high throughput, it's called proteomics. And the word omics keeps going on and on, and we'll, we'll see that in a bit too. Basically what he did was prove that on a molecular basis, if you looked at the combination of genes that were either upregulated, downregulated, or stayed the same, you consistently got clustering of patients into five groups. Even though under a microscope, they looked identical to the pathologist. This is a very important departure because it basically advances our pathologic understanding to the molecular level. It tells us we, sh we were up until now being fooled by two cancers looking the same under a microscope. They actually can be very, very different. And very different biologically usually means very different clinically, very different in how they're going to behave over time, very different in which organs they're likely to spread to. All of those have very important implications of treatment, not the least of which they have different pathways that are helping them become more aggressive or less aggressive. That means different drugs are likely going to be effective in targeting them. Prior to this, chemotherapy development was trying to come up with well, which one drug or two drugs or three drugs or four drugs in combination can kill all breast cancers. Suddenly our understanding changed. You can't succeed if you try to treat all breast cancer with the same regimen. Ideally, you need to tailor it for each individual subtype. And even though there's five molecularly that came up with, there's essentially three main groups. The luminal A and B group is essentially one group for description purposes. It's estrogen receptor positive. The HER2 group is again HER2 positive. So there's two parallels even on the molecular basis that we already kind of knew about based on discoveries that we'd stumbled upon earlier. Basal-like is a molecular group that fits most with triple negative. In fact, it's the really bad variant among triple negative. Normal-like is the group of triple negatives that doesn't quite do as poorly. And for the first time, we were able to decipher the triple negative group, or at least have some insight into what was going on. So did these groupings that we just spoke about, did they have prognostic significance? Yes. If you defined the tumor only as being, not as being ER positive or HER2 positive anymore, but ha belonging to one of these molecular groupings, it, made, it had a huge difference in survival curves. As it's shown, the upper one is based on all patients, regardless of whether they had other things that matter, like lymph node metastasis or not. Well, you might think, well, maybe that skewed the results a little bit. What if you didn't have lymph node uh, Mets. Is the biology still that important that it could affect results? The answer is yes. That's the lower curve that's shown. So the lower curve is all patients that didn't have any disease that had spread to the lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis, and yet the survival is still bad. What this showed, again, for the first time, is prior to this, our clinical, the clinical way that we would divide patients as having good prognosis, fair prognosis, or poor prognosis was based on a staging system that we call TNM staging or AJCC staging. TNM stands for tumor size, N stands for nodal disease, whether they have lymph node metastasis or not, and M stands for do they have distant metastasis to other organs or not. Obviously, if it's gone to the nodes or worse, gone to the somewhere else, it's more advanced disease, they're likely not going to do well. But the combination status of any one patient based on TNM is what we traditionally use to designate stages of disease to the patient. So stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. This information for the first time illustrated, there is a dimension of the cancer that is no less important, in fact, maybe as important, maybe even more important than the TNM stage. Meaning you could have a large tumor, you could even be in the lymph node, and your survival was still not as bad as somebody that had a small tumor with no lymph node metastasis if they were triple negative or basal-like. So you could no longer ignore the biological type of the cancer. In fact, for the really aggressive ones, it seemed to matter even more than your TNM stage. This remains a drawback currently in our clinical management that we have not been able to incorporate biomarker status in our staging, but that is an 
active area of research being pursued by um, the American Joint Committee on Cancer. And I predict within the next five years, you are gonna see biomarker status as part of staging, because it's obviously too important to ignore. Not only that, it's how we determine treatment uh, decisions nowadays, is based on your biomarker status. So our breast cancer classification understanding changed. It was no longer ER, but we're actually calling it a molecular type now. HER2 positive was a HER2 subtype now. Well, we know what the type was basal like, but we really didn't have a single marker for it. And this is the point at which my lab, um, when I was in fellowship training, got involved. We really wanted to find one gene marker that could tell this third group apart, um, and hopefully down the road, be able to tailor treatment to that group better. So we saw this chart from before, but now we had molecular names for each of these luminal, HER2, and basal-like, but there's still two question marks. What's the diagnostic biomarker for that third group, and how can we personalize therapy for that group? Um, loosely, the triple negative group, again, it's defined on ER, PR, and HER2 negativity. It's not an insignificant group, depending on where in the country you go, and based on what type of racial profile that population has, it can be as high as 15 to 20 percent of all invasive ductal breast cancers. It is very heterogeneous because they have variable prognosis and response to drugs. So even though we see a uniform poor curve, that's an average curve. Not everybody's gonna do worse, and some people are gonna do quite worse. So how do you tell them apart? Um, you needed a better biomarker to demarcate within that group. Unfortunately, 50% develop metastasis. That is a crazy high number in any cancer. 30% um, succumb to their disease in as early as five years. And some of the people I'm talking about, unfortunately, this group, they get cancers when they're in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Not the typical age profile that most people associate with, which is 60s and above. Um, there's no, there was no effective way to stratify these patients, no effective way to accurately identify the molecular type. There was the gene expression way but that wasn't clinically accessible to most people because that involved measuring the expression of, at a minimum, 326 genes. That's a PCR experiment nightmare in most, most labs. And so it was very illustrative, but you couldn't really reproduce it on a regular basis. You really needed a single gene test or as close to single gene as you could get. Um, most importantly, there was still no targeted therapy like you kind of have for the first two groups. Um, just as a side note, the importance of being able to tailor therapy to a group. When that first paper came out on estrogen receptor, average breast cancer survival at five years was 70% all comers. That means 30% died even if they had an otherwise favorable disease. And if you looked at HER2, it was 50%. If you looked at basal-like, it was 30%. That's how bad the numbers were, and that's not so long ago. That was in the 1960s. Since the tamoxifen drug became established and since Herceptin came established, overall, survival for breast cancer has improved to greater than 90%. That's how big a difference targeted therapy can make. Um, the remaining 10 is a largely a reflection of the basal leg group, which if you look at alone, even by current day standards, even with aggressive chemotherapy, that group still has a five-year survival of about 75%. That's still way better than it used to be, but obviously it could get way better if we had targeted therapy for it. So obviously there was a big need to identify these patients better, figure out what kind of biology is driving this group better, and hopefully use that information to deliver tailored therapy for this group. Um, so how do we profile cancers based on the level of biologic information. Well, if you're measuring DNA and you're measuring whether it's amplified or not, mutated or not, things like that, uh, and you're doing it in a high throughput fashion, meaning you're not measuring the gene one at a time, you're not measuring them in groups of 10 or 20, you're measuring pretty much all 20,000 to 30,000 features at a time. That platform is called genomics, and even our original early platforms have gotten much better that um, we're able to do 
uh, much more detailed and accurate analysis nowadays. Um, but the high throughput platform is still best for discovery. It's still not best for routine application for every patient that we see in the clinic. So usually what we want to do is use the high throughput platform to find out which of the 20,000 matter for this particular indication and then design a more cost effective assay to measure only ones of interest. And so if you design assays like that at the DNA level, usually you're looking for single panel, single gene mutations or panel gene mutations. We already have tests like that for breast cancer. Many of you have heard of BRCA1 and 2 gene testing. That's testing for DNA mutations, single genes at a time. That information didn't come about by accident. They had assayed many genes to try to figure out which ones are important. They finally figured out those two matter, and they finally figured out this was a way we could translate that information into a more cost-effective means. I would argue it's still not cost-effective because those tests cost $4,000 each. So we still have a ways to go. Um, next is trying to assay information at the RNA level. Well, so what's the advantage of trying to measure things at the RNA level in a cancer cell versus the DNA level? Well, it all starts at the DNA, obviously, but if some changes are there at the DNA level, meaning even amplification, does it really get um, transcribed on to the RNA and does that really get translated on to the protein enough to functionally matter? You won't know until you check that sequence all the way through to the protein level. But a good compromise is to at least check it at the RNA level because if you're measuring a gene is higher or lower at the RNA level, you've already proven the first step has already happened, meaning that information has already gone for that gene from the DNA level to RNA level to maybe matter. Pending um, confirmation at the protein level. Because until you do, even a change at the RNA level really doesn't matter. Unless the protein that it's encoding for is actually lower or higher and somehow has an effect on one or the other pathway or one or the other mechanism for that cancer cell. But it's a good compromise because you still retain the ability to measure pretty much all 30,000 features at the RNA level pretty robustly on platforms that were called transcriptomics, and that was the one used by Dr. Peru. Um, but again, it's not cost effective to do it on everybody on a routine basis, but QRT-PCR is a cheap enough technique you can do for every patient sample that comes in. Next is protein, and again, the high throughput platform is called proteomics. Um, before we had proteomics, we had the two-dimensional SDS page that you'd seen. Nowadays, you can um, tell up to five or 6,000 features apart. That's the main drawback of protein level high throughput assessment. Even though it's the most desirable to do it at this level of information, because you're that much closer to telling, well, I already have a high express protein or a low express protein, so now I just have to figure out is it really affecting cell function or not. The problem is you can't assay all 30,000 proteins at the same time. The, the technology platform doesn't allow you to tell that many apart accurately. You can only tell apart about five or 6,000 at a time. You can design your experiment so that you're only looking at cell membrane proteins or cytosol proteins or nuclear proteins or basically proteins that you're segregating based on you know, subcellular fragments, but still, at a time, you can only tell that many apart. Um, once you know, though, which protein it is that's of interest, you can measure it on the cancer cell or you can measure it in the serum um, with immunohistochemistry, which is a technique based on antibodies. And you've heard many techniques before that describe use of specific antibodies. Um, there's also something called DNA methylation, which is sort of a step between the DNA and the RNA above it's a, it's a level of regulation in the cell that we've come to understand. If certain DNA segments are methylated, they're not allowed or prevented from being transcribed into RNA. By the same token, if they're hypermethylated, they really don't get transcribed. And if they're hypomethylated, they're transcribed quite a lot. And so that level of regulation is called epigenetics. 
among other things. There's two different areas typically that we talk about. One we talk about methylation. Um, one is uh, the CPG motive, and the other is uh, uh, I'm blanking on that molecular designation, but. But the high throughput platform is epigenomics. There are ways to measure the methylation status of the entire genome. Once you know, though, which ones are being important, you, you don't have to measure them all at the same time. You can again, do single gene or panel gene methylation studies. And there's several other levels of information that are uh, you know, coming to light as being important. There's non-coding RNA. There's short non-coding RNA. There's long non-coding RNA. And we'll continue to hear about these. And their respective high throughput platforms are still in evolution, but they're coming. Um, so we decided to concentrate our studies on the RNA, because so far it was a robust technology. It had been used enough in cancer. In fact, there had already been enough raw data generated across the world for us not to have to replicate the whole experiment. We had the raw data to go back to and analyze, except we analyzed it more from the, the triple negative or the basal-like standpoint. So this slide sort of tells you the approach we adopted. Um, we really didn't have to do anything up until the data analysis because all of that had been done on separate groups of breast cancer patients, maybe 100, 200, 300 at a time, in many labs across the world. And in the spirit of sharing scientific uh, results so that other people could maybe use the same raw data to find new answers, all of those investigators had made their data freely available, uh, and it's on the NIH repository. Um, just to give you an idea of numbers, we had access to more than 2,000 patient samples, all of whose tumors had been transcriptomically profiled. We had all of that raw data to go back and look at and make hypotheses or generate hypotheses about which gene did we think was going to be a promising marker. So it starts with the surgical biopsy or the surgical resection specimen. Then you use the technique that you heard about earlier, which is tumor microdissection. You don't want blood vessel tissue or fibrous tissue or nerve tissue in your sample. You want pure cancer cells in the specimen you're gonna assay. That's one of the main benefits of doing tumor microdissection. Then you're gonna extract the RNA. There's obviously very specific protocols to do that. Ideally from fresh tissue or frozen tissue, not so ideal from FFPE tissue, but it can still be done fairly accurately. And then you hybridize the RNA, actually you generate cDNA first from it, and then you hybridize that to a gene expression microarray. Um, and then you analyze the data. Um, from that, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit about what we did for the data analysis, you come up with your suggestion of a candidate biomarker. Again, this is an RNA level biomarker that you haven't, you don't have any other information about other than you think its status, expression status, either high or low, can tell apart your subtype tumor of interest. And then you go through the motions of proving that what you came up with is actually important. How do you do that? Well, if you check the, the level of that RNA or that gene at the protein level on other tumors, and it seems to predict the same diagnosis again and again and again, well, it's probably got diagnostic importance. So it may be a diagnostic marker. Can it predict prognosis of patients? Well, then it can prove prognosis over time. Is it biologically important? So you run different assays by either turning the gene on or off, and you figure out, well, is this just a silent bystander biomarker, or does it really matter to the aggressive biology of the cancer? So then you do functional significance. And I'll get into that a little bit, not too much today, but there's three things we always check in general about a gene. Is it really important in cancer or not? Does it drive growth of the tumor? <coughs> Meaning, does it help the cancer cell proliferate? That's an assay that we always check for and see, is, it, is that gene doing that or contributing to that property or not? Does it help the cells invade into surrounding tissue? So that's called an invasion assay. And third, does it just invade or does it actually migrate through and spread to other places? Because that's an indicator that it is likely going to metastasize or spread. So that's a migration assay. Growth, invasion, and migration are three cell properties that you can measure in the lab with just cell lines. You don't need necessarily expensive animal models to go to first. You do to prove that 
what you got in the cell lines is actually mattering or not. But then uh, the ultimate test is in human patients, are you seeing increased metastasis when that gene is high or low? Um, or are you seeing increased spread to lymph nodes when that gene is high or low? Um, you obviously want to go from less expensive experiments to more expensive experiments, so that's, that's the uh, order in which we go. So that's the called clinical validation. Um, this is just a heat map picture of, in this case, 249 patients. This is a subset of the 2,000 plus we looked at. And based on non-supervised clustering, we always got that cluster. On the top is, you see some bright red spots and that was the best that you could uh, see the basal-like cluster. But if you started defining that cluster based on a gene that we had found, which is called FOXC1, it's called forkhead box C1, it's a protein and it's actually in the nucleus. And it actually is a central player because it helps even a minor uh, increase or decrease in it affects um, several other genes going up or down. That's what a transcription factor is known for. Um, so if you started defining it based on genes that go up or down with FOXY1, you see the band becoming much more prominent. And what that started to tell us is that group of patients is likely better defined on FOXY1 expression status than the other markers that had come up with prior to that. Well, this is just a gestalt view, but does that matter with numbers? Well, as we're seeing in this group, this is compared with other suggested markers of basal-like at the time. As you can see in the top left, the gene status for the one that we thought was going to be important was much higher, at least again on a relative scale, than the others were. The others are also getting high, but they're not consistently high. This is just to show you, well, what, was there a fold change difference in a group of interest? And as you can see, regardless of which group of patients we surveyed, it was always consistently high, it was always a significant result. But variation was there, and the variation has more to do with the um, isolation procedure for the RNA and it not being the same procedure being followed in all the separate study labs that have generated the data for all of them. So could you measure quantitatively whether this gene could always tell basal-like apart from all the others? There are statistical tests you can use. Among those, there's something called Wilcoxon rank sum test. That's a univariate test. That's a very good first-line test. But it's univariate. You all ideally want to check a multivariate level uh, statistical test to be sure. And the multivariate test we used was logistic regression. But this is just one panel. Again, we checked them all, and every single group of patients we surveyed, FOXY1 always tended to rank at the top. So this was all still hypothetical data. This was going back and looking at um, huge amounts of data and analyzing it and figuring out, well, does this gene status seem to matter? Well, overexpression of FOXY1 seemed to matter, but did it really? Another question was, well, we got it from tumor samples from human patients. But was there a guarantee it was actually coming from cancer cells? Or was it coming from contaminants in the tumor from other cells? One way to try to help answer that is look at cell lines in the lab that you know are going to be tumor cells and see if FOXY1 is high or not in basal-like cells. At the cell line, other things seem to matter more than FOXY1, but it was still important. So why is that different than the results we were getting before? One reason is all of these cell lines, or cancer cell lines in general, are cell lines that have been isolated from metastatic sites. So it has already changed biologically from primary tumors in the patient. Second, the way we maintain these cell lines in the lab is in 2D culture. That's physiologically a very different environment than how cells exist in the patient. And, and just growing them in two dimensions is enough to change what genes matter and what genes don't for the cells to stay alive. That's often enough to change cells that normally matter in situ or in vivo in the patient to what's important trying to stay alive on a plastic uh, flat plate in media. Um, but it was still consistent enough. Several cell lines that were basal-like had a high enough expression. It was different in several, but it was still very, very high in that group. So it seemed like, okay, it did seem to be of the cancer cell origin. 
and we wanted to check the status of the C1 at the protein level using immunohistochemistry with antibodies. And uh, this is just a comparison with ER and HER2, which are negative in the basal-like group. CK5 and CK14 are basal cytokeratin proteins, which are uh, covering the surface of basal cells. It's not specific to cancer, but in, when you're only looking at cancer, it's a helpful marker. And then we have FOXY1 staining, and this was not with the best antibody at that time. It was with the best commercially available antibody at that time. And it definitely stained positive. Those are the brown spots. Those indicate where is it positive in the nucleus. Um, we did develop our own antibody, which was optimized to work better at detecting things on formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which is actually the most common way pathology tissues restored worldwide. Um, and the panels over here are actually showing you bands as different clones uh, of the hybridoma cells that you had seen earlier. <laughs> That's how we develop monoclonal antibodies now as well. And we picked uh, 11 and uh, 7, I believe, to be the best ones or the strongest ones. Again, which antibody is best for which type of technique can vary. For example, uh, the antibody reaction to detect proteins, as you saw, uh, is used on Western blotting. Actually, a different monoclonal antibody might be better for Western blotting than it is for immunohistochemistry. You would never know until you check both, depending on which platform. So that's one reason when you're trying to do experiments and you're trying to order antibodies, you have to read the manufacturer instructions about, well, this antibody is great, but it's really optimized for Western blotting. Or this antibody is great too, but it's better for immunocytochemistry or fluorescence. Um, so that's why there's a difference. Uh, the panel on the bottom is actually showing you staining with the new antibody, so it definitely is more robust and clear. Um, just going back to uh, whether the status of genes could tell prognosis apart or not, this is the same picture you'd seen earlier, and this was based on those um, molecular subtype groupings based on all 326 genes at a time. And that was telling luminal apart from the other two in green and red. Well, we wanted to see what the FOXY1 gene signature did. And if you're negative, it was sort of an average of the blue and green. If you're positive, it had a striking similarity with what you were predicting based on having to know 300 plus genes at a time. Well, this was a gene signature because we really didn't think the gene itself could really tell. Uh, usually you need that gene and others that go up or down with it to be able to tell. But we tried it, and with just a single gene status, it was still being able to tell these groups apart. And that, that basically was the first indication that this is a central enough gene or an important enough gene in the biology of this group that just its status is enough to drive the main biology of basal light. But it still wasn't proof, because this was suggestive. We never really checked yet, is the gene expression by itself matter in affecting the biology? We'll get to that too. Um, this is again curves, again from the molecular gene groupings, and again by FOXY1 alone, again on the transcriptomics uh, platform. How good was it at predicting whether you were going to have metastasis that go to the brain or not? And could it pre predict reverse metastasis predilection to the bone or not? And that's sort of what these curves are showing. Um, on the bottom, if you had a high FOXY1, you had a lower brain metastasis-free survival because you were more prone to have meds go to the brain. And, and, and the reverse for the bone, you actually didn't have a predilection to go to the bone. Even though you were aggressive, you tended to gravitate towards and go to other organs but not bone. That These are basically things that tell us about the biological patterns of behavior of cancers in general. So, um, This is now curves on separate data uh, using IHC. And this is showing you uh, tumors that are either have triple negative status or not. That's on the left. If you were trying to tell basal-like apart based on the CK514, which was the at that time the best available markers pathologists had access to, and the far, left, far right over there is if you were defining it based on absence of ERHER2, but you're adding presence of FOXY1 to it. So the change is subtle on the graph at least, but statistically it's much more significant. And one way you can tell is, what is the spread in between the curves? 
That's one way of telling, at least approximating. Um, but you'd always have to do univariate and multivariate statistics to tell it apart. Which marker seems to matter more in predicting prognosis? That's one way to tell. Well, the criticism may be that, well, these curves, you're just grouping all the others together. And statistically, that's actually not correct. I did it here because it's easier to see the difference. But here I show them all, and despite including them all in the analysis, it's still significantly different. Um, and an interesting thing was observed. We grade positivity on immunohistochemistry as a one, two, or three positive status. That's a purely subjective assessment that the pathologist says, this staining looks weak, this staining looks intermediate, and this looks strong. That's how one plus two plus three plus is done in the lab. There's no real quantitative measure to the IHC. There's, there are now where you have image analysis to try to do it, but you didn't traditionally. So if you used the one as a cutoff for negative and anything higher than one as a positive, the middle panel shows you that's the one that was the best cutoff, so to speak. Um, you could still have, po uh, have relevance at all three cutoffs, whether you, it was a two or a three, but your best cutoff, at least with the IHC assay as it stands now, is one plus is negative. Anything greater than one plus is positive. And it had prognostic significance on uh, all the statistics that we ran, not just on one. So that basically proved that the marker is true. If you get, get relevant results on one, but not all the way through, that usually means your marker is not having prognostic significance. It has to meet all the tests that we put it through. This, this last one is, has to do with methylation status, but basically what it means is if you're U Foxy1 or unmethylated, your gene was being expressed that had worse survival than the other one. The difference with this group of patients is this group was treated with chemotherapy, and despite that, they still had worse prognosis. So this means it's predicting the lack of efficacy of a drug called doxorubicin. So Foxy1 also seems to be having diagnostic importance, prognostic importance, and predictive importance. Um, this is just a workflow diagram to show you tests that we're developing. The top panel is with IHC, but it's not, as I said, quantitative. And so the lower panel is measuring it at the RNA level, which you can measure in terms of quantity or fold change. That's QRT-PCR, again, it can be done off of FFP tissue, and that's under development, so that it can be done as a routine low-cost assay for every patient in the clinic, not just as a research level test anymore. Um, so I told you about diagnosis, prognosis, prediction, but does this gene matter? And so, as I told you earlier, there's three tests that we put the genes through. Does it affect growth? Can it affect invasion and migration? Um, so these are cell lines. The top one is a triple negative tumor, but traditionally had low FOXY1. So we overexpressed it on purpose. That's the pink line. And so you can see the cell progression went up. The lower one is an ER positive cell line, which we artificially engineered to express FOXY1, and its goal, fold goes up. Why this is important to show in two different backgrounds is even if you take a cell line that is very dependent on estrogen receptor for its growth, or ER, so that's MCF7, and you introduce a single gene, it's able to subvert the control of that otherwise powerful gene and completely change and morph that cell. That's very difficult to do usually at, in the cell lines, especially when you're trying to do it in a cell line with a very different background of biologic control than, than the MDA MB239, because that one's already triple negative to begin with. So the fact that Foxy1 did it there was, was a good observation, well, but many people would say is an expected observation. If you actually did it so much so that you reversed the biology from an ER positive cell line to an ER negative cell line, that helps prove how powerful your gene may be in, in driving all these aggressive properties. And the panels on the left, it just shows migratory cells and invasive cells. Those circular pictures over there that's growing in soft agar just shows that colony formation is increasing. Those are all signs of aggressive growth. Um, these are other pictures again to show that it affects certain uh, gene levels that help 
um, digest, if you will, the tissues surrounding the cell, allows the cell to migrate. Those are matrix metalloproteinases. In this case, they were MMP2 and 9. Um, it affects uh, cyclin D1 levels that helps proliferation. It's just an indicator, well, how was it affecting growth? Well, it might be through mediating this gene, among others. Um, and then there's some other genes that it affects. I won't get into that, but basically it, it, those are, that's demonstrating that uh, FOX1 is helping the cell acquire uh, properties which change the shape from a cuboidal shape to a spindle-shaped uh, cell. Uh, Spindle-shaped cells usually indicate they can spread uh, more easily. Uh, that's just a visual uh, thing, but when you measure spindle-shaped cells for genes that help digest and migrate through tissue, you see all those genes uh, are upregulated. Um, these are cells where we knew they were basal-like. The top one is a human cell line. The bottom one is Sorry, the top one is a mouse cell line, which is basal-like. The bottom one is a human cell line, which is basal-like. And they have natively high FOXY1. And they normally are very aggressive, as you would expect. That's the blue. If you knock the gene down artificially with something called short hairpin RNA, you got a dramatic fall in growth, dramatic fall in migration, dramatic fall in invasion. So you basically reverse the aggressive property if you were able to target the single gene. So th these are just the tests that we put candidate genes through to see does it have biologic relevance in the cancer that we thought it did or not. And it, and it definitely appears that, it do that FOXY1 definitely does. Now these are cell line experiments. These still have to be validated now in, in like mouse experiments. And then we have to validate and see does it, did it matter with in humans with metastasic deposits and such. But um, definitely it's, it's proven every test we've put it through thus far. And so our understanding now is we have a marker now for basal-like. A very strong candidate, seems to outperform others. Um, it's FOXY1 and we will have a, a clinical test for it very soon. Um, what we still don't have is how do we target these cancers that we now are identifying based on FOXY1 expression. So those are experiments underway. So this is again the same table. Uh, we think we've uh, been able to do away with one of the question marks. That still needs to be um, further proved and validated, but it still leaves one glaring question mark. And that's what everybody in breast cancer with basal-like basal is uh, concentrating on these days. So just through the historical timeline, um, this happened in 2010. Hopefully it won't take as long to target this one. Um, conclusions are definitely appears to be a powerful surrogate tissue level biomarker. It seems to have all of those three properties that um, would make it a theranostic biomarker. The only thing it doesn't have is predicting efficacy of something. Oh, so we've shown it can predict lack of efficacy of things we have, but we don't have a drug yet that it can predict efficacy for yet. Um, definitely seems to be functionally important in contributing to aggressive properties. Uh, it may serve as a potential target itself, uh, not probably with traditional drugs, but with newer classes of agents. Uh, that's more like gene therapy or siRNA delivery. Um, it definitely merits further investigation and introduction into the clinic as a marker. Um, and uh, it may help define hybrid groups. I know I simplified the talk earlier by saying there's three groups, luminal, HER2, and basal-like, and that's it. But there's gray zones in the middle where they seem to meet. And the gray zones have kind of properties of both luminal and HER2, or both HER2 and basal. Um, those are obviously not as numerous in terms of patient group sizes, but it's still important. And it might be why when you treat a luminal group basal like a luminal group breast cancer patient with tamoxifen, you get benefit up to a point and then you see resistance. Well, they, you might be seeing resistance in that group because their biology is not defined only by ER, but has some contribution from being HER2 positive slightly or being basal-like slightly. And so um, you'll be seeing elucidation of hybrid groupings like this also in the future. So with that, I'll end my talk. i take any questions at this point. Your questions don't have to be related to what I spoke about, but can be you know, any question that you have from a clinical standpoint. So thank you for your attention.
yes, it is possible to knock the gene out, but um, in the cell lines, we've done it with shRNA, you can do it with siRNA. Uh, whether you can do it in humans or not remains to be proven. The main problem with um, knockout approaches to genes in cancer therapy is that you can get it to work in the cell line, you can get it to work in the mouse model. As soon as you administer it to patients though, before what you administered reaches the tumor where it is in the body, it basically gets digested in the bloodstream by different proteases. So then you have to protect it so that it stays intact before it reaches the tumor. One way we do that is encapsulate it in artificial membranes. We call those um, nanoparticles or liposomes or such. But uh, then you have to contend with, well, what's making sure that this nanoparticle is not going all over the body? How do I make sure it's going only to the cancer? So then you have to come up with ways to target it to only the cancer or cancer cell of choice. So there are several hurdles to it. In theory, it's definitely possible. So far, there's no FDA drug that's approved with using that approach. But um, that's definitely something you'll be seeing in the future. Yes. Um, so for the studies, um, did you, was it only female samples or were there male samples as well? So, so far, very good question. So far we only used uh, female samples mainly because those are the ones that are um, available in greatest number. Male breast cancer, strangely enough, has, is rare, but of the men that get it, they're often ER positive tumors and they don't tend to get the basal light one. The problem with male breast cancer is um, because it's not a commonly thought of diagnosis in men, they're often diagnosed late by the time they already have lymph node metastasis. Questions? questions. Yes. Um, when you checked for prognostic, when you did a prognostic marker for it, or as you said, as a prognostic marker, yes. uh, you used it for which therapy, for radiation? Oh, so we, when you're checking for prognosis, you try to make sure that all the groups had the same treatment. Yeah, but which treatment did you? Oh, so the, all of those patients had surgery and chemotherapy, only if they were lymph node positive, and radiation therapy only if they had lumpectomies done. Most, most women don't need radiation if they have a mastectomy, uh, if it's a large tumor or such. Uh, but uh, lumpectomy alone is not considered a safe enough surgical treatment. So anybody who gets lumpectomy, always gets radiation with it. So those were the constants in therapy for all those patients. Despite that, if your tumor had FOXC1 expression, you were not going to do well. So, so for when you're comparing prognostics, you try to keep all the other variables the same so that the only things that are changing are the status of the gene that you're checking for. And that's why the curves are comparable. If you used different treatments among the groups, then you didn't know if the survival curves are changing because you use different treatments or it's because of the different gene status. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, did you also check um, the concentration that you have to use perhaps? For, uh, like, do you do the dose response to that? Um, for the doxorubicin study, no. That was another group's paper. They, the, the way chemotherapy drugs are dosed is based on um, uh, weight per body weight. And it has to do with how much of the drug will distribute because someone might be bigger, someone might be smaller. So what you try to make constant is the same concentration of the drug will be reached in the bloodstream of that patient. And so in that study, they used the same concentration of doxorubicin for all patients. Despite that, whoever had the FOXY1 high level had a worse prognosis. So what that tells us is the drug is fine for non-FOXY1 expressing tumors, but the drug is not good enough for basal light. So you said for delivery or targeting use the nanoparticles, right? Well, we hope. It's untested right now. Correct. I'd like to have said I did it already, but I haven't. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you highlight a little bit more about uh, the property that drives the metastasis process? Say, uh, you know, from breast cancer is going to the bone. For other cancer, it's going to the other places. Like, is it like? Some sort of distribution coefficient, uh, what type of property do you guys look for? Well, I didn't go into that too much here. The, the, the properties that you start with are, does the cell tend to be just happy staying where it is on the growth plate? 
or does it tend to invade despite artificial boundaries? That's an invasion essay or migration essay. Um, but to answer your question with regard to organ-specific metastasis, um, that we still don't have very good answers on that. Other than uh, there are, there does appear to be definite genetic programs that the cell clones acquire that make some of them more prone to go to the lung. It's not that they go to the lung in preference. They're, when they're once in their bloodstream, they're going everywhere. But some of them find it easier to set up shop and stay in a lung environment because they already have the genes upregulated and downloaded to suit that. But they don't have it for brain, for example. But other clones in the same colony develop, have a genetic program that makes it easier for them to cross the blood-brain barrier and set up shop in the brain. Others find it easier to simulate for the liver, lymph node, bone, like that. And it's still not clear why some of them get a certain type of genetic program or the other. Um, we have, there is in the literature reported to be several individual implicated genes that help drive uh, bone versus brain versus lung, but it's anywhere from being fully answered. So, yes. Um, so you said that you looked at this data that has been published by these different groups Correct. in order to choose your, this Foxy one. So what was it that made you choose this particular gene out of this data? Sure. One, the approach we took was a little bit different than groups in the past. Groups in the past were trying to come up with combination of genes that could tell all of the groups apart. So it wasn't, for their definition, it wasn't good enough to come up with one or a few genes that could just diagnose one versus everybody else. Because they were coming, trying to come up with a classification for all. Which works well, but sometimes it doesn't work well. And this was a case in point because all the data I'm talking about was already out there, had already been published, had already been looked at multiple numbers of times, but never with our approach, which was, I don't want to concentrate on being able to tell all of them apart. I would like to concentrate on what defines basal-like and only basal-like, and its status is enough to tell it apart from all. I, I don't necessarily need the gene to tell me who's HER2 positive or who's luminal, or normal-like or luminal A and B, I just want a candidate to tell basal-like apart from everyone. So if you use that kind of statistical screen and then you use it to analyze all the data, you will get a very different rank order listing than what they had gotten in the past. So that's the main thing that channeled us towards this gene and then everything else sort of followed. But um, let's say there, uh, there is a fifth group, it's called normal-like. Uh, nobody's really done that approach on normal like yet. I mean, I think Dr. Peru's group was looking at that, but they may not necessarily have um, utilized the same type of statistical strategy that we did. It would make complete sense to try to find out, well, what's the driving gene or more important than others for normal like? Um, and you could do this. Uh, the, the main thing I wanted to tell everybody is uh, breast cancer has benefited from intensive research for many years, this, this model can easily be replicated in all the other solid tumors that are lagging behind, simply because research dollars haven't been expended as much on tumors that are not as common. For example, bile duct cancer. People don't usually hear about it, but it's a devastating diagnosis because it gets picked up very late. It's often not operable. Um, patients have a dismal prognosis. Well, if you did the same type of studies where you took samples from everybody and did transcriptomic profiling or other levels of profiling, came up with genes that, that mattered, uh, studied their biology, then you would start the process at least by understanding is every bile duct cancer the same or are there different groups? And maybe we need to use different groups of drugs that we already have, but don't use it for every bile duct cancer use some for group one and some for group two and things like that. So uh, pretty much the feeling in cancer research is that that approach will work and that approach already is working in lung cancer even though that the way we came about it in lung cancer was different than in breast cancer. It's already working in prostate cancer. Um, it's already working in it had already worked in leukemias and lymphomas much before this level of understanding came about. That was through chance discoveries, which is why um, leukemia and lymphoma nowadays is very well treated, it, most of the time. 
Um, but, but there's every reason to believe this kind of approach in general will work very well for gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, bile cancer, liver cancer, and pretty much every solid cancer. So, All right. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I think everybody's hungry, but I'd be happy to take your question separately if you want. So. One more, and then we have to really go past the book. Sure, that, that's what I was thinking. Go ahead. You mentioned that you now want to test how to the delivery of drugs in the national Yes. Those have been many complications on drug delivery. It's practically, it has not been possible to get it from the delivery. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, most papers, uh, most people when they publish the data, they use uh, a very high concentration of that may not be Right. I mean, you tend to, if you administer that many nanoparticles, they tend to form artificial clots and can um, clog blood vessels in various organs and. Um, artificially cause necrosis in organs, basically. So ideally, you want to be able to inject a lower concentration. When I mean targeted, you have to coat the nanoparticle ideally with something that helps it home in on the cell. One problem with basal like we don't know which surface molecule to choose. And so we intend to use a proteomics approach to come up with, well, what kind of homing molecule can we use now that we found out what to target inside the cell. So actually, what we use to deliver the nanoparticle will be a different molecule or even a group of molecules. And what we use to target within the cell to shut it off are, are different candidate genes, like FOXC1. There's another one called FOXM1.